his talk was wonderful and uh, the latter also whenever I, uh, I i attend his talks it was it was very lucid and it was uh, i mean it, it was like built for the students so I'm, i have been a fan for of his talks and also of his writings after i read this i mean actually it was an exposition so it was about the primes if you expand it in, in any base and convert the base to any um, in, i mean this to a variable it becomes a irreducible polynomial and that it was it's called cons uh, cons criterion no i forgot exactly cons theorem or cons criterion but it's 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 a, it's a beautiful theorem and he's he's proved that he gave a beautiful explanation of this so so um and also there are many good books in analytic number theory by by professor ramurthy except um, uh, um, very brilliant uh, uh, research articles like um, the books which are very useful for students in analytic number theory are the problems and uh, problems in analytic number theory and their um, I mean non vanishing of l function which is a, um, a book also written by professor kumar murthy and uh, and him jointly is 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 a, a wonderful book from bilkerser and i actually um, uh, when i was a phd student i uh, usually visited his home page and there was a there was a, uh, there was something called um, Um, how to do mathematical research, or the art of doing mathematical research, and this was something that I, I like to read from his complex. I mean, it was kind of motivating uh, while I was doing my research. So, yeah, I, I have been a, a fan of Professor Ramurthy for a long time, and it's a pleasure to introduce him to, to the to you for for this talk. So, Professor Ramurthy, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Somia, and thank you uh, the organizers of this uh, meeting. Now let's see. I think I have to do something to share my screen. What is the what is the oh is it this this thing? Maybe it's this thing. Uh, a window. Okay. Uh, select window. Uh, let's see. Now can you can you see this? Not yet. Oh yeah, right. We can. Yeah, we can see. So okay, okay. Um, let's see how does this work. Uh, okay, so supposing I were to scroll, let's see, do I? Um, is it full screen mode or no? I don't want to do full screen mode because I can't see anybody. I, I know how this Google Meet works, and I've not um, been happy with the interface because when I put in full screen, I lose everybody. And uh, can you see what I'm showing? Yeah, 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 yeah. You can see that. Okay, so can I just? Should we just keep it like that? Yeah, it's all right. We yeah. keep it, it, it forward. Does it move forward? Um, let's see. Does is this is this is this appearing on your screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Let me just clean it. see okay so let's see you tell me because i can't i can't see what you can see if you can't see what i'm going to say please let me know uh, so here's the outline of the talk there are four parts in this talk Uh, firstly, I will begin with uh, Newton's theorem and applications. Um, second, I will uh, discuss the Anand-Dumir Gupta conjecture and how commutative algebra entered into the realm of combinatorics. Second, uh, third, I will discuss the Rota-Welch conjecture and the work of June Hu and others. Uh, the Rota-Welch conjecture is uh, rather dear to my heart because uh, I was a student at MIT and. Uh, Uh, Jean Carlo Rota, uh, you know, was one of my teachers, and uh, in fact, we collaborated and wrote a paper while I was a graduate student. And at that time, he was trying to get me to work on his conjecture. And in some sense, perhaps maybe I maybe it's fortunate that I did or I didn't. I don't know. Um, obviously, it it requires a, quite a bit of artillery. Uh, from commutative algebra, from algebraic geometry, and so on and so forth. So that's uh, one of my real motivations for trying to understand uh, Jun Hu's work. And finally, uh, of course, uh, one of the 
problems that is very close to my uh, heart uh, is uh, the study of the Riemann hypothesis. And uh, there's quite a bit of connection, intimate connection to the Riemann hypothesis and what are called jensen polya polynomials, which I will discuss at the very end of the talk. So in this process, we will be connecting many areas of mathematics ranging from number theory, commutative algebra, algebraic geometry, and combinatorics. And I think that's one of the most beautiful aspects of this particular topic. Now, clearly, um, because it, the talk encompasses all of these uh, beautiful areas of mathematics, and I can't say I'm an expert in any of them, uh, so there will be some um, uh, perhaps lapses in my detailed understanding of various things, but uh, that's the fun of it, I suppose. And uh, certainly there's some experts here who can probably fill in uh, some of the details if I'm stuck. So for, let's begin then with um, a basic question. Uh, the title of the talk is Unimodal Sequences from Isaac Newton to June Hu. Uh, so the first question is, uh, what is a unimodal sequence? Uh, a unimodal sequence is a sequence of numbers A1 to AK such that there is an I such that it goes up to A sub I and then comes down after that. So that's what a unimodal sequence is really. And you're all familiar with um, unimodal sequences because uh, since childhood, you've been playing with the binomial coefficients, the, uh, the entries of the binomial, um, the Pascal, so-called Pascal triangle um, is, is a unimodal sequence. Every row you can see, for example, take one, five, 10, 10, five, one, or one, four, six, four, one, the sequence goes up and then comes down. So this is a unimodal sequence. And then we, we say a sequence is log concave uh, if you have the property that ak squared is bigger than or equal to ak minus one times ak plus one for all the intermediate uh, points from a, a2 to am minus one. So now it's relatively simple to see that if I have a log concave sequence, then I have a unimodal sequence because if uh, suppose it's not unimodal, that means uh, there must be, a, you know, it, it didn't go up and it didn't come down. Therefore, there must be a case such that AK minus one is bigger and then AK plus one is, is uh, and it's AK plus one is also bigger. Uh, and then AK is smaller than, it must have had a dip in that, in that way, uh, with at least one of the inequalities being strict. And then if you just look at it, AK squared is less than AK plus one times AK minus one just by that inequality. And one of the inequalities has to be strict, therefore you get a contradiction. So log concavity property or log concave property um, is implies unimodality. So uh, people have been making conjectures about unimodality of certain sequences. And it seems from, all, from my uh, humble understanding that the stronger property of log concave uh, property seems to imply, uh, it seems to be easier to, to prove uh, in, in many ways because it has a certain conceptual um, connection. So the sequence of binomial co coefficients is actually log concave because you just do that if n choose k squared, you re rewrite that as n choose k minus one times n choose k plus one times these fudge factors and you immediately see, yes, it's log concave. So not only is the binomial sequence, binomial coefficient um, unimodal, but it's actually log concave, which is a stronger property and it's, it's easier to prove. And so we'll focus on this stronger property. So yeah, so and as I said, it's sometimes easier to prove the stronger property uh, for conceptual reasons and that'll soon become apparent. And it's interesting that these uh, sequences play a major role in many, many parts of mathematics. Uh, so what does Isaac Newton have to do all this, with all this? Well, uh, Isaac Newton is, of course, well known for his uh, contributions to physics, notably the laws of universal gravitation and optics, as well as his discovery of the calculus, method of fluxions, as he called it. However, he has many other important contributions to pure mathematics that are less well known. For example, he has this beautiful theorem, which I'm going to discuss right now, on log concave sequences, which is derived from calculus, and that is not well known, but it seems to be very important in uh, combinatorics. So prelude to Newton's theorem, before we st state and prove Newton's theorem, that may help to review some basic calculus, especially Rowley's theorem, especially because 
if I understand this club, math club, uh, it's quite possible that there are a number of undergraduate students in, in the audience and therefore to keep it kind of min, uh, prerequisites as minimal as possible, I will review Rowley's theorem. Uh, so if I have a continuous function, differentiable function actually, uh, in an interval, it crosses the x-axis at A and crosses the x-axis at B, then Rowley's theorem says there's an intermediate point where the derivative is zero. And so what does that uh, mean if I have a polynomial of degree n and it has n real roots, that means it crosses the x-axis n times, and therefore the derivative has degree n minus one and crosses the real axis n minus one times also. So it has n minus one real roots. So this simple idea is going to be used in a very fundamental way by uh, Newton. Uh, and notice, by the way, the geometry of that previous statement. So this, the geometry. So it's one thing to say a polynomial um, of degree n has n roots, but it's another thing to say this polynomial crosses the real line n times. That's a geometric representation. So this interface between interplay between um, geometry and algebra is a very important feature of much of what I'm going to discuss uh, today. So Newton's theorem discovered in 1707 by him uh, states the following. If I have real numbers alpha 1 to alpha n, you let sigma sub k be the kth elementary symmetric polynomial. So sigma 1 is just the sum of the roots, sigma 2 is the sum of the products of the roots taken two at a time and so on and so forth. And the final one is of course all the product of everything. And uh, what Newton does, he writes this in a funny way. He just puts sigma k to be n choose k times a sub k. And then he, sho he shows that um, with a k defined in this fashion, you have a k squared bigger than a k minus one times a k plus one. In other words, if I have a polynomial uh, with roots alpha one to alpha n, and I write my coefficients of the polynomial in this funny way, n choose k times a sub k, then the a sub k satisfy this log concave uh, property. And uh, this theorem has wide applicability. Uh, it certainly applies to the binomial coefficients because the binomial coefficients appear in the expansion of x plus one to the n. So we now see again a beautiful generalization of something usually dismissed as being obvious that you have a very profound generalization to the realm of uh, these polynomials. So it can be applied to other sequences that we, sh we shall see. So a corollary of Newton's theorem is the following. Normally we don't put binomial coefficients in front of the coefficients of polynomials Newton did, and the coefficients are up to sign the elementary symmetric functions. And so we can reformulate a Newton's theorem in terms of the usual coefficients uh, and then you, you will find that um, Newton's theorem implies this, this stronger property. Sometimes, by the way, the people refer to this strong log concave property. Uh, let's not get into this. It's basically this property here, this extra factor of one plus one over k, one, one plus one over n minus k. But anyway, we rewriting it in, in usual terms, we can say if I have a polynomial with real coefficients and all its roots are real, then bk squared is bigger than or equal to bk minus one times bk plus one. I think this is a beautiful theorem. And um, how do you prove it? Well, there are lots of proofs. Um, uh, let me give you one proof. Uh, this is not the, my favorite proof. My favorite proof is actually something um, to do with complex analysis, which I will get to at the very end. Um, but let's, let's take this proof for now. So from our hypothesis, polynomial has all its roots real. And let's just assume all the roots are distinct, just so that we don't um, clutter up the argument. So if these roots are all distinct, it's crossing, the graph is crossing the x-axis um, in n distinct points. So, uh, we, so we see that the roots of the derivative of polynomial interlace, that's the fancy word, interlace the roots of p of x. And so proceeding inductively, we see any derivative of p of x with all its roots real and distinct. And the trick to proving Newton's theorem is to homogenize the polynomial by considering this homogeneous uh, things, n choose j, a sub j, x to j, y, the n minus j. And then we may view this as a polynomial either in the variable x or uh, either the variable y. 
And by our remark about any partial derivative is also a homogeneous polynomial with real uh, distinct roots. And so in particular, let's take the n minus uh, truth derivative with respect to x k minus one times differentiation uh, with respect to y n minus k minus one times differentiation. Well, let's differentiate. I mean, we all know how to differentiate. It's a linear operator. It goes into the, into the summation. And then you can see inside this. Uh, hello, yes, does somebody have a question? Um, okay, um, in, inside the summation, we have a partial derivative. Uh, and we see immediately that the partial derivative um, vanishes unless k minus one is less than or equal to j is less than or equal to n minus uh, k minus, and, and sorry, k minus one is less than or equal to j, and n minus k minus one has to be less than n minus three in, in order for this to be non zero. And that means essentially that j lies between k minus one and k plus one. There's only three terms in this thing, and these, this is easily calculated. Lo and behold, the, this partial derivative turns out to be a binary quadratic form. And we all agreed that this, how many times whatever derivative you take, this, this thing has real roots. Therefore, this binary quadratic form has to have real roots. And that means, bingo, you get that um, ak squared is bigger than or equal to ak plus one times ak minus one. So you get this log concave property from this uh, thing. So beautiful, beautiful theorem. And it's very simple. You can teach it to first year, first year calculus students after you've taught them Rolly's theorem. OK. What are the applications of Newton's theorem? Well. Any permutation, remember, can be written as a product uh, of disjoint cycles uniquely. This is the, you can think of this as the analog of the unique factorization theorem of natural numbers uh, in, the, in the world of permutations. If you let uh, absolute value of SNK be the number of permutations in the symmetric group on n letters with exactly k disjoint cycles, uh, then it turns out that um, the polynomial with these coefficients has a nice expression, x, x plus one to x plus n minus one. So the polynomial on the right-hand side has all real roots, and therefore we can apply Newton's theorem, and lo and behold, we get that the absolute value of these, these are called Stirling numbers of the first kind, by the way. Uh, the absolute value of the Stirling numbers, S, N, K, turn out to be a log concave sequence, and therefore unimodal. In other words, these, the, the number of permutations with exactly K disjoint cycles goes up, and then comes down. You see, so you get this really beautiful theorem for free, practically, just from this very basic thing. And this uh, polynomial identity, I don't know if my cursor can show you this, but this polynomial identity um, is actually very easy to prove. Okay, these are called Stirling numbers of the first kind. Uh, we can also apply uh, Newton's theorem to what's called Stirling numbers of the second kind. Um, this is capital SNK. It's a number of ways we can decompose an N element set into K disjoint uh, subsets. Uh, so this is the Stirling number of the second kind. And the polynomial now, this P sub N of X, you create this polynomial and you want to show this polynomial has real roots. Uh, there's no neat factorization uh, like we had for the Stirling number of the first kind here, but you, you can um, derive a simple recurrence relation for the Stirling numbers. And then you can find that the, this recurrence relation for the Stirling numbers of the second kind leads to a nice recurrence relation for these piece of N of X's. And then we can rewrite this whole um, thing in the following way. If you set Q sub N of X to be E to the X piece of N of X, then the relation above uh, immediately implies Q sub N of X is equal to X times Q sub N minus one prime of X. And so by induction, we deduce that QN of X is all its roots real. And therefore, again, applying Newton's theorem, we get the unimodality of the Stirling numbers of the second kind. So this is the proof of this fact. Usually in many books, uh, these uh, properties are actually proved in a comp more complicated way. But you can see that Newton's theorem does uh, an efficient job of giving the proof. And one more application that I want to bring in, simply because it's, this is going to appear at the very end of the talk, uh, applications to Hermit polynomials. These Hermit polynomials have a generating function. If you take e to the 2xt minus t squared and expand it as a power series of t, the coefficient will be a polynomial in uh, x. And these are called Hermit polynomials, very beautiful polynomials. Uh, and then if you differentiate with respect to t, you get one recurrence relation, this one. 
And if you differentiate with respect to x or, or you or do something else with the, you know, if you multiply both sides by e to the minus x squared, you will see that this series can be written as e to the minus x minus t whole squared. And differentiating this equation with respect to x comparing coefficients gives you another relation, namely that uh, the, the, the derivative e to the minus x squared h n of x turns out to be e to the minus x squared times h n plus 1 of x. Now, you can apply the induction argument, which says that um, if h n of x has all its roots real, then any, any, <coughs> any derivative also has roots real, therefore h n plus 1 of x <coughs> is also, has all its roots real. So exponential function never vanishes, so easy uh, induction argument now reveals that all the roots of hn plus one of x are all real and interlace those of hn of x. Now in the literature, uh, there's a fancy word uh, used to say, I have a polynomial of degree n, all its roots are real. The fancy word is hyperbolic. So polynomial with real coefficients and all its groups real is called hyperbolic in the literature. Okay, so keep that word in mind. And now let me come to the second part of this talk, the Anand Dumir Gupta conjecture. Now, in a seminal paper by Harsh Anand, Viswa Dumir, and Hansraj Gupta written in 1966, a simple question and conjecture were formulated that inspired the development of commutative algebra with a view to applications in, in combinatorics. Now, I couldn't find a picture of Harsh Anand. Um, I believe she is female. Uh, then there's V.C. Dumir, um, who was at, at Punjab University, who I, I did meet. Hansraj Gupta I've never met, um, but uh, he was also at Punjab University. And uh, their question was very simple. Suppose I have n object, distinct objects, each available in R identical copies, and they're distributed among n persons in such a way that each person receives exactly R objects. How many such distributions are there? So this is a very simple question. You can also think of this as a, some sort of weighted chromatic polynomial coloring problem with graphs. Uh, and the precise version of the conjecture uh, that's made in their paper is that if you let eight sub n of r be the number of such distributions, they conjectured that firstly, eight sub n of r is a polynomial in r. The degree of this polynomial turns out to be n minus one squared. This is their conjecture. And that h n of j turns out to be zero when j is minus one, minus two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then they uh, hypothesized a nice, beautiful functional equation: h n of minus n minus r is equal to h n of r with a sign minus one to the n. So another way of thinking about this is via systems of linear Diophantine equations. You can also interpret it as the number of n by n matrices, A, I, J, with non-negative integral entries such that the row sum and the column sum turns out to be the same number R. So that's another way of thinking about it. And uh, these ways of thinking about these things are useful, as you can see in a, in a few seconds. Now Stanley, Richard Stanley, um, uh, wrote two papers on, on this conjecture, 1973 and 76, and, and these papers were beautiful in many ways. Uh, they were for, firstly for introducing methods of commutative algebra to study combinatorial problems of this kind. So the intriguing idea in this paper is that this is really a problem in commutative algebra. And so, you know, as many, one, many of you know, in number theory, for example, conjectures are often uh, sources of great inspiration and, and lead to the development of mathematics by you know, at an exponential rate. Um, and from 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 our last theorem, for example, is a case in point, which led to a rapid development, exponential development of algebraic number theory. In many ways, the interface between combinatorics and commutative algebra was um, uh, expedited uh, by this conjecture. So, what did Stanley show? He showed that if you form a power series with these coefficients, then uh, the conjecture is actually equivalent to saying that the power series is rational function, that the denominator looks like one minus t to the power n minus one squared plus one, and that the, the uh, functional equation that uh, they had alluded to leads to the uh, hypothesis that these coefficients h sub i are symmetric, 
And so uh, imbued with this insight, um, Stanley made a few more conjectures in that book. Um, first, that the HIs are always non-negative, and then the second, that the HIs are unimodal. Aha, unimodal. Um, that's what we started off with. So how is uh, unimodality shows up again here? And uh, it's an interesting that uh, the key idea in Stanley's work is to interpret this power series as the Hilbert series of a certain graded module. And then there's a famous theorem called the hilbert serre theorem that if you have a finitely generated module, um, the Hilbert series is actually a rational function and you can also tell what the denominator looks like. So using that uh, and some other things too, uh, Stanley finally proved all these uh, beautiful uh, parts. Of the, the conjecture, um, the history of this, uh, develop, these developments um, uh, are nicely exposed in uh, Professor Jubal Varma's uh, paper uh, in Mathematics Student in 2013. So by the way, uh, I'm one of the editors of Mathematics Student, so I, I invite people, uh, if they have um, beautiful expositions of complicated mathematics, I think this is the place to uh, put that, and, and this is a case in point where um, this conjecture is discussed. Okay, now let me move to the third phase, uh, trying to describe June Hu's work um, uh, related to chromatic polynomial graphs. Now, most of you know uh, that if you have a graph of n vertices, no loops, uh, we love loops and multiple edges rather, uh, proper coloring of G is an assignment of colors to each vertex. So there are no two adjacent vertices which see the same coloring. And uh, in 1912, Garrett Burkhoff defined chi G of lambda to be the number of um, proper colorings of G using lambda colors. And there's a familiar operation in graphing called volition contraction operation. It can be used to show that chi G of lambda is actually a polynomial of degree N in the following way. If E is an edge connecting two vertices, adjacent vertices, the graph G minus E is the graph obtained by deleting the edge. And the graph G slash E is the contraction of the same edge. And so whenever you have a proper, co uh, proper coloring, it can be obtained by extending a proper coloring of G minus E. And every time that there's a bad coloring, that means the two vertices that were joined by um, E got the same color. That means you really, that really collapses to a color of G mod E. So you take away those colors. So this is a very simple um, sieve idea, inclusion, uh, exclusion operation. Last term enumerates those extended proper colors of G uh, modulo E uh, minus E in which two vertices joined by E receive the same color. So a simple induction argument now on the number of um, vertices uh, allows you to show that chi G of lambda is a polynomial. And the same induction argument shows that the coefficients of the chromatic polynomials alternate in sign. So these are very interesting uh, facts uh, obtained for free practically. And since the number of ways of coloring uh, a graph using zero colors is zero, lambda equals zero is a, is a root. So I can factor chi lambda, take lambda out, and then these, I get these numbers, a0, a1, dot, 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 am minus one. And in 1968, Reed conjectured that these coefficients of any chromatic polynomial are unimodal. And Six years later, in 1974, Hopar made a stronger conjecture there in fact log concave. Now, the, this, these are the conjectures that were proved by June Bull in 2012, and he was awarded the 2022 Field Medal for this work. Uh, this was the conjecture <clears throat> that I think <clears throat> Rhoda was mentioning to me when I was a graduate student. And then he had a generalization of this conjecture to matrices, which I will talk about. And he was trying to get me to work on this thing. Uh, very interesting uh, stuff that uh, appears that these coefficients now have um, connections with uh, community development and algebra geometry. So I'll try to explain that. So the rota welsh conjecture <coughs> was formulated independently by Rota and Welsh, and these concern mathematical objects called matroids, um, which can be seen as a generalization of graphs. Now, um, I remember Rota was never, never liked this word matroid. Uh, his word was uh, combinatorial geometry. So he, he thought that um, just as you have algebraic geometry, you know, which is coming from um, solutions of equations of polynomials over, uh, you know, fields, et cetera, which is a 
basic object of study in algebraic geometry, he wanted to say that there's something called a combinatorial geometry where something similar is happening, but you're getting it from the combinatorics of an arrangement of points on the plane, points and lines, et cetera, et cetera. So, these, this, so he wanted to actually use the word combinatorial geometry as a parallel a universe to algebraic geometry. <clears throat> but anyway, this, this word matroid has seems to have stuck. Uh, so the concept of matroid actually goes back to Hassler-Whitney in 1935 as an abstraction of the notion of linear independence that arises in the theory of vector spaces. And there are several ways of uh, defining matroids. Um, here's one way. A matroid M is a pair where E is a finite set and F is a collection of subsets. And these collection of subsets are called independent sets. And so what do we want independence to satisfy? Well, we want the empty set to be independent. And every subset of an independent set should be independent. And then thirdly, if A and B are independent sets with the cardinality of A less than cardinality of B, there has to be an element in B, call it X, such that A union X is also independent. So you see this kind of idea of abstraction, very powerful idea in mathematics, where you look at the obvious and you see the extraordinary in the obvious. And by seeing the extraordinary, you axiomatize and end up with this remarkable structure. And then you can go look for the structure in many, many problems. And this, this, these problems do no exception. So if G is a finite graph and F is a set of all subsets of uh, edges of G, which do not contain a cycle, then it's not difficult to verify that the, these subsets uh, satisfy the independence axioms. So we call this the matroid associated to the graph G and the you know, M of G. So matroids arising from graphs in this way are called graphic matroids. And therefore you can see graph theory, which is very important these days uh, for many, many network theory, network problems and so on and so forth. Even chat GPT uh, uses uh, graph theory in a fundamental way. Uh, so you can see that, but actually there's matroids seem to be the more important idea and, and graph theory is a part of matroid theory. So one should perhaps pay attention to this, this uh, perspective as well. And uh, just like we had uh, chromatic polynomials of uh, graphs, we can talk about what are called characteristic polynomials of matroids. So given a matroid M, uh, a subset E, which is not an independent, is called dependent. And a minimal dependent set is called a circuit, and the maximal independent set is called a basis, of course. These are kind of familiar from your vector space. And similar to the case of linear algebra, one can show that all bases have the same cardinality, which is called the rank of the matroid, and it's usually denoted as R of M. And generally, if A is a subset of E, we denote R of A to be the maximal size of an independent subset of A and call it the rank of A. This allows us to define what's called the characteristic polynomial of a matroid. So notice I use the same kind of symbology as I did for the chromatic polynomial, and indeed there is a connection between the two. So chi sub m of lambda is just an alternating sum, lambda to the r of m minus r of a, uh, where we go over the subsets of E, uh, and we attach uh, this sign, which is minus one to the power of a. And the summation is over all subsets of, of E. And so we can rewrite this polynomial by grouping together the coefficients of lambda to the i. You can group all these numbers together and you get these w0 of m, w1 of m, et cetera, et cetera. These are called Whitney numbers of the first kind. Hey, we talked about Sterling numbers of the first kind. Well, it turns out that you can concoct a graph, uh, actually a complete graph, in which the Whitney numbers uh, in that for that particular complete graph, um, graphic matroid to be precise, uh, coincide with the Stirling numbers of the first kind. So this is a very much a generalization of Stirling numbers of the first kind. And uh, Rota's conjecture is the unimodality of these guys, these coefficients. And the stronger conjecture of log concavity was proposed by Welsh and Heron in the 1970s. So both conjectures are now theorems of are the Posito, Ku, and Katz. And so they got the, well, uh, who got the Fields Medal uh, for this work. So this is again a, a follow up on his work on the chromatic polynomials. He also worked on the uh, characteristic polynomials of matroids and proved the same log concavity 
property for these uh, Whitney numbers. <clears throat> And of course, there are Whitney numbers of the second kind. Um, and um, how are they defined? Well, they're defined as the number of independent subsets of the matroid of size k. And so these generalize the Sterling numbers of the second kind. And Mason conjectured that these numbers are again log con k. Uh, and this is again deduced from the solution of the Rhoda Perrin Welsh conjecture because you can take the, uh, the uh, you can associate a, or concoct a certain matroid such that the Whitney numbers of the second kind of your, this matroid coincide with the Whitney numbers of, of another matroid uh, of the first kind, M prime. And then now you apply the, uh, the adiparsito who cats theorem. And so let me now give uh, a very quick introduction. I wouldn't say I'm an expert on this stuff, but I'll give you an introduction of how community algebra and, and algebra geometry kind of figures in to this, uh, to this stuff. So, uh, the key ideas uh, here in this work are inspired by number theory, algebraic geometry, especially the Vey conjectures. Now, most, some of you may not know much about the Vey conjectures, but the Vey conjectures were conjectures formulated by Andre Vey in the late uh, 1940s, maybe early 1950s, uh, and have to do with number of solutions of um, various algebraic varieties over finite fields. And he made these remarkable conjectures about the rationality of a certain generating function. Sounds familiar, right? Rationality of a certain generating function and symmetry of the uh, coefficients. Sound familiar? Sounds like um, symmetry in the, the uh, Anand Dumier Gupta conjecture. And then um, the functional equation. Sound familiar? Yes. Again, something similar is going on. And then finally, there's a Riemann hypothesis associated, which is, which is not present in the combinatorial work that I've been discussing. So the Bay conjectures were actually proved by Dillon in 1974, utilizing cohomology theory of algebraic varieties. I wouldn't say I'm an expert in all those things. Uh, this theory is nothing uh, but associating certain vector spaces to a variety with some functorial properties, and we will give an abstract description now. So I, I do, I did downplay it. I said this is theory is nothing but it's a, it's a kind of an oversimplification of, of, the, of the matter. Um, rather, perhaps. It is better to say that there is some sort of structural similarity in the way the solution to that, those problems have been set up, that uh, have been abstracted in the, the program that Hu has embarked on. And that abstraction is what uh, Hu uses in his reformulation of many of the questions in combinatorics, uh, Rhoda Welch conjecture, the, the Reed Hogar conjecture, et cetera, et cetera. So let me just say there's a linear algebra paradigm. This is a word that I didn't make up. Uh, this was a word used by Stanley in his book. Uh, suppose you want to study a sequence of numbers A0 to AN, non-negative natural numbers, and you want to prove that it's unimodal, symmetric, and log con K. The problem will gain an added dimension if you can associate vector spaces, V0 to VN, and linear maps, some sort of inclusion maps from VK to V0. This one says that maybe the dimension of VI is AI, that phi k is injective and vi is isomorphic to vn minus i. So you see here, here, is, here it is. Here's your unimodality. Here is your symmetry. Uh, here is you know, interpretation of these numbers as um, dimensions of vector spaces. So then the sequence is clearly symmetric and unimodal. And this is the idea. But instead of talking about a single, like a bunch of single vector spaces, you can try to build all these vectors or paste all these vector spaces together into some sort of graded vector space and a single linear transformation. And uh, this is just a simple notation, change of notation of the above paradigm. And the paradigm underlies the work of Dylan as well as the work of who and his co-authors in their solution of these famous conjectures and combinatorics. So what is their general formula? Well, it is a solution to the reed hogar conjecture who identified this formalism inspired by these developments. Uh, you begin with a mathematical object, call it X, to which we associate some sort of dimension D. And for example, X can be the algebraic variety of dimension D over field F. Often it is possible to construct some sort of graded vector space over R that has a decomposition as a graded ring, often a cohomology ring of sorts. And uh, then there's always a lurking in the background, there's a symmetric bilinear pairing called T. Uh, taking pairs of elements of A of X into R. 
a graded linear map on each piece, call it L from AJ to AJ plus one, which is symmetric with respect to the bilinear pairing P. And the linear map L usually comes as a member of a sort of a convex cone. Um, the convex cone is, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's a set of elements which are closed under this convex addition operation, you know, lambda alpha plus one minus lambda beta type of uh, operation. So you have uh, this convex cone of operators on A of X and letters capital P, capital L, capital K have been deliberately chosen to suggest the names of Poincaré, Lepschitz, and Kaler, uh, which are familiar names and put familiar uh, ideas in, in um, algebraic geometry. So the following properties are assumed, some sort of bilinear pairing showing that AJ of X is, symmet is isomorphic to AD, AD minus J of X, uh, given by this non-degenerate pairing. Then, then you have this, these uh, operators in this convex cone, L1 to LD minus 2J, that actually make that isomorphism um, precise, explicit. This is called the hard left shift theorem for X. And then, um, then there's these hard Riemann relations, that once you have this thing, you can have a pairing um, between AJ and AJ itself, uh, which is positive definite on the kernel uh, of, the, of the linear map that was taking AJ uh, into AD minus JX, and this ex it's a given explicitly in terms of these products of these LLs. So this is all very uh, beautiful ideas of Jun Hu. Uh, these are called the hodge riemann relations inspired by classical algebraic geometry. So the novelty of Hu's work is that these formal properties can be embedded in, the, in a combinatorial uh, setting. So that's my uh, summary of the formalism. So what does he do? Well, he associates a ring. I told you just like um, Stanley in the solution of the ADP conjecture was associating some sort of ring to the conjecture and identifying graded ring, identifying the Hilbert series of that ring as um, uh, essentially the power series associated with those numbers that the uh, HN of R that the uh, ADG conjecture refers to. Similarly, the idea here is to somehow cook up some uh, ring, graded ring, in which these dimensions and, and, and in these, uh, of these pieces can be interpreted, or at least the coefficients of the chromatic, uh, the, the characteristic polynomial of the metroid can be interpreted as um, essentially being associated with some sort of positive definite matrix in this uh, ring. So the ring is uh, very simple to describe. It's not difficult. Uh, you create an indeterminate X sub F for each element in the um, family uh, of, made, of um, independent sets, uh, of, of um, script F, flats, they're called. Uh, and then you say, uh, if you take an A and B in E, and if you look at the, mono, the, the linear polynomial X sub F, as F ranges through elements such that A is in F, they should be equal to summation X sub F. So this is one relation in the polynomial ring. The other relation is that X of F and X of F prime should be equal to zero whenever F and M prime are incomparable in that in the partially ordered set of uh, flats, as I told you what they were called. And then you create this uh, A sub J of M. It's a span of these degree J monomials in that thing. And then you have a decomposition of this ring as a graded ring. And then um, the formalism implies is a unique linear isomorphism, a uh, degree map, uh, uh, from A of M into R, which maps this monomial X of F1 to X of FD to one for every maximal chain in the partially ordered set. Uh, so this partially ordered set has got a maximal chain of non-empty proper plots. And every time there's such a chain, this thing is mapped to one. And um, Abhi Porcito, Hu and Katz showed that if you look at this particular uh, element, uh, and uh, product of the LIs that was coming from the, um, the formalism. And you look at uh, for any U and V, well, the, the U's and V's have to be, uh, I, I, I'm gonna skip the definition of the U and the V, but anyway, for the U and the V, the, this particular matrix has exactly one positive eigenvalue, and it's a two by two matrix, therefore the determinant is negative, and that gives you this inequality the degree of eta u v squared is bigger than degree of eta u squared times degree of eta v squared. And uh, that allows you to uh, interpret that um, these coefficients 
of the chromatic polynomial or the characteristic polynomial uh, can then be interpreted in this inequalities. Basically, you get that these coefficients ei of m are actually degree of alpha to the i beta to the d, uh, d minus i for every i. And using that positive definiteness of the previous slide, you end up getting the log concave property of these coefficients. So this is basically how um, the combinatorial problem is translated to a commutative algebra problem, and then using uh, the theory that uh, he has set up and, uh, and interprets these coefficients as degrees of various monomials uh, in this particular graded ring. So that's my lightning summary of what um, um, who has done and why he was awarded the Fields Medal for this work. It's an amazing uh, feat. Now I want to uh, con uh, you know, conclude with um, what does this say, and does it say anything, towards the Neumann process? So um, the obvious question to any, anyone who sees Newton's theorem, and these things too, by the way, the other things too, is uh, what is the connection to Riemann patches? Um, so they, they were dealing with polynomials. And so is it possible to extend Newton's theorem to um, um, power series? Mm -hmm. So following generalization of Newton's theorem is due to Laguerre. Uh, he says, take an entire function um, and it has to be of order one. Uh, something that's order one means it doesn't grow too fast, okay? That's, that's what order one means. To be precise, for any epsilon positive, the absolute value f of z is bounded by essentially e to the mod z to the one third epsilon. So Sterling's approximation to the gamma function shows that one over gamma z is an entire function of order one. And um, the Riemann zeta function, defined originally as summation one over n s, um, you can concoct this what's called the Riemann c function. SS minus one pi to the minus S over two gamma S over two zeta S. And it turns out you can show that this has order one. And uh, by the way, I should have told you that uh, Riemann showed that this function has an analytic continuation as an entire function and a functional equation relating S into one minus S. So here's Laguerre's theorem. Supposing I have an entire function of order less than or equal to one. Suppose for real Z, F of Z is real value and that all its roots are real. Then f prime of z is again real value for real z, and the zeros of f prime of z are also real. So this is the generalization of Rowley's theorem to infinite power series. So if you write f of z at summation of a k z to the k, lo and behold, you get this uh, log concave property. So this is what Laguerre showed. Looks awfully familiar. So what does this have to say about that. So let me just give you a lightning proof of Laguerre's theorem, and you will see the cognoscenti in the audience will see immediately that uh, this proof can also be applied to give another proof of Newton's theorem. So this proof is better in some sense uh, because it includes Newton's theorem. So let R be the multi set of non zero roots of f of z, which may be finite or infinite. f of z is order R with R equals 0 or 1. You can use Hadamard factorization theorem. I'm going to go a little fast. Sorry about this. I am going to assume that you know a little bit of complex analysis here. Uh, and also I'm running out of time, <laughs> better speed up. <laughs> so uh, so you can write f of z as e to the a z z to the d times one minus z to the over a e to the r z over a, where r is the order zero or one. And um, you can more or less consider um, the fact that the f since f of z is real, then z is real, all the roots are real. And uh, then you can show the too much difficulty with capital A and capital C are real. And taking the logarithmic derivative, you can write f prime of z over f of z in this fashion. And the right hand side is real for real values of z. We immediately see that f prime of z has to be real. Taking the imaginary parts, we see that the imaginary part of f prime of z is this. And there's no way this silly thing can vanish unless y is zero. See, if, if f prime of z is zero, means the imaginary part has to be zero. Therefore, the, the, all the roots are actually real. So by induction, the roots of the derivative are also real. So this proof, by the way, notice it's a nice proof, complex analytic proof, and that calculus, first year calculus proof that we gave doesn't extend to this situation. So it's very important to understand this. And now because this is negative, 
you get this inequality that the, how do you differentiate f prime over z? F, we all know how to do that. It's um, f of z f double prime minus f. So that's got to be negative. And this applies to any uh, thing. So if you apply it for z equals zero, you end up getting log concavity property for the, the first stage. And then if you apply to the higher derivatives, um, you end up getting the, the final theorem that ak squared is equal to ak minus one times ak plus one. So this is, the, this is the beautiful, beautiful theorem of Laguerre. And these results have serious implications uh, to the Riemann hypothesis. So application to the Riemann zeta function. So I told you that the Riemann zeta function satisfies this functional equation, c of s equals c of one minus s. And so if I change variables on this c function, and call it c of one half plus i z, the Riemann hypothesis is the statement that this new function has all its roots real. That is the function c of half plus i z has all its roots real. And because of the function equation, you have an even function. And so um, you, you, you look at the power series expansion at both z equals zero. Laguerre's theorem would predict that these unimodality, uh, sorry, log concavity of these coefficients but this is easy because it's an even function. The odd <coughs> coefficients vanish. So in this case, this is more or less coming out to be cheating. Um, so you don't, you change variables and you only look at the even ones. And then <coughs> the uh, Riemann hypothesis implies all the roots are real. So Laguerre's theorem would imply that gamma 2k squared is at least gamma 2k minus two. Um, I think I made a typo there. It's gamma 2k minus two and gamma 2k plus two, that should have been. Okay, sorry about that. Um, and uh, this was conjectured. So this is the basis of what's called Polya's conjecture in 1927. And Polya himself has a curious history on this on this point. So let me try to, Polya, where's, where's Polya? Uh, very famous mathematician, lived practically a hundred years. Um, in 1966, actually, Groswell proved the law of concavity conjecture of Polya for sufficiently large k. And then uh, 20 years later, Chordas, Norfolk, and Varga proved, proved it for all k, thus giving some support to the Riemann hypothesis. It's interesting that the second reference I got, believe it or not, from ChatGPT, I didn't know who, I had a vague, um, you know, fragment of a memory that somebody um, improved on Groswell, but I didn't know who it was, and I was trying to get it to tell me, and finally it did. Uh, so chat GPT makes lots of mistakes. However, sometimes it can be useful. You better check it. Uh, in this case, it gave me this reference, which is a nice paper. So yes, this supports the Riemann hypothesis because uh, the Riemann hypothesis predicts this should happen and bang, you know, you got it. Uh, so this seems to be a very important development. And so Polya asked himself, what further conditions are needed to ensure Riemann hypothesis? And he stumbled on this while studying uh, the Jensen's work. So how did that happen? Editing Polya's collected papers, Morris Marden has a nice uh, commentary on Polya's 1927 paper. And he says it was the outcome of Polya's findings on examining the Nachlass of the Danish mathematician J.L.W.E. Jensen, who died in 1925. 14 years earlier, Jensen had announced that he would publish a paper regarding the algebraic function theoretical research on the Riemann zeta function. In view of Jensen's well-known interest in the zeros of the polynomials and entire functions, expectations were very high that Jensen would contribute to the solution of the Riemann hypothesis problem regarding the zeros of the C function. However, this paper of Jensen was never published. And so on Jensen's death, it was a matter of paramount importance to have this paper examined by an expert in this area. And so Professor Polya undertook this task, but after an arduous examination, he found no clue to any progress that Jensen may have made towards the Riemann process. And so he was trying to reconstruct what could Jensen possibly have been thinking. And so he came up with this brilliant, brilliant theory. So Polya derived the necessary and sufficient condition for the Riemann process. This has to do with the hyperbolicity. Remember I told you it was a fancy word to say that I have a polynomial with real coefficients and all the roots are real, what's called hyperbolicity. Hyperbolicity of a family of polynomials of which the first one is a log concavity of the Taylor coefficients. And so here's a formal description. Supposing I have a sequence of numbers, you define the jensen polya polynomial of degree N, um, sorry, degree D and shift N by this 
funny summation, summation k equals zero to d, d choose k, a k plus one, x to the k. Notice, notice the introduction of the binomial coefficient inside that coefficient of the problem, like Newton was doing. So you see some great minds seem to think alike, and it seems appropriate to keep it like that. So when you actually work this out, the first couple of polynomials are, first one is just a sub n, second one is a linear polynomial, third one is, hey, a sub n plus 2an plus 1x plus a sub n plus 2x squared, quadratic polynomial, next one is cubic, dot, dot, dot. And now we see that um, um, the pole, his theorem is that this power series has real zeros, if and only if all of these polynomials have real zeros for every DNF. So the hyperbolicity of that second one is the log concavity property of the sequence. So log concavity is the tip of the iceberg of a whole bunch of properties that you would have to see satisfied uh, in order to prove the Riemann hypothesis. Now I, I am um, putting this question out um, for the case of um, you can do the Jensen Foliar Jensen polynomials for even finite constructions, even those uh, polynomials that we discussed earlier, especially the ones coming from algebraic geometry and uh, related to the Bacon vectors. And um, one would then get uh, an equivalent criterion for the Riemann hypothesis. And the question then I'm asking is um, what can you say about the Jensen poly poly polynomials in, that, in the Bacon vectors context? Does it show? Some can you show that the uh, these are all hyperbolic that the roots are all real if you do when you have the Riemann hypothesis? Well, some recent progress toward the classical Riemann hypothesis has been made in the last few years. Let me just tell you what this is. Um, firstly, uh, the next step I told you Groswell, Chordas, Norfolk, and and uh, and Varga proved that that the second Jensen polynomial had roots all roots real. The third Jensen polynomial has all its roots real was done by Dimitrov and Lukas in 2010. And the striking theorem that all for sufficiently large D, all these polynomials have roots real was proved by Griffin, Ono, Roland, and Zagier in 2019. Very spectacular development. And two years later, 2022, Griffin, Ono, Roland, Thorner, Tripp, and Wagner showed that for all D less than 9 times 10 to the 24, all of these things have all the roots real. So it looks as if the Riemann hypothesis has been reduced to some sort of finite computation. Uh, indeed, Bombieri announced that these developments are a major breakthrough. That's a published paper of Bombieri that you can look at in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. But as Farmer, David Farmer points out, Jensen polynomials are not a plausible route to proving the Riemann hypothesis because uh, there's a theorem of Y O Kim. Uh, that says any entire function f of z of order less than two, which is real on the real axis, which has zeros inside the strip, has for any fixed r the property that f n of z has only real zeros uh, inside that disk. In particular, it's not surprising that these things has all its roots real for d sufficiently large. So that's not a so the real part part of the problem seems to be find out what is the effective estimate coming out of the um, the uh, paper by Griffin, Ono, Roland, and Zach here. And then you have to show all these polynomials um, uh, from zero to whatever are hyperbolic. Uh, and I believe the bound, uh, unfortunately, is exponential compared to this um, result of the 22 thing. So the fugitive Riemann hypothesis is still an elusive mystery. So I think I've more or less run out of time. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. If anybody has any questions, please please go forward and ask Professor Ramurthy. Uh, I have a question. Please. Uh, so, firstly, thanks. It's really brilliant over overview of the topic. A little bit fast for me, but but still very uh, good to see it all put together in one place. Um, if we can go back to the conjecture of um, I think it was Anand, Dumir, and Gupta. Yeah. Do we now, in the light of all the future, uh, all the stuff that's been done since then? Do we have an interpretation of the numerator and denominator? Is it um, 
uh, even in the in the subsequent work, have we seen anything about a, an operator and a characteristic polynomial of that operator or anything like that? Uh, okay, so I'm going to answer it, but, I, but the expert in the in, is, is Jugal, who's uh, I think in the audience. But I think, as far as I'm aware, uh, yes, that that is the idea, that it's the Hilbert series. I'm trying to find the slide here. It's the Hilbert series of a certain polynomial ring, and 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 so I believe the coefficients of the Hilbert series are dimensions of uh, some graded pieces, right? So I think uh, we do have. The, the, co the coefficients are, but but the final thing is a rational function. Oh, yeah. And then what I'm asking is the polynomials that appear in that rational function, the numerator and the denominator, do they have an interpretation? Yeah, in yeah, particular. That's right. I think that they do. They do have an interpretation. But maybe Jubal can add more to this. Yeah, yeah. So the coefficients which occur in the numerator. Uh, so they, they, uh, that polynomial is called the H polynomial, and uh, that is associated with a uh, ring which is associated to magic squares. So if a magic square has uh, line sum R, you know all the row sums and column sums are R, uh, then uh, the, the, this number is associated with dimension of a vector space. And that vector space is uh, coming from a graded ring. Uh, this graded ring is associated to, uh, uh, this is a ring generated by monomials. And each monomial is corresponding to one magic square. So then, then the, all these monomials generate a graded ring. And uh, the dimensions are the function HNR, which is the number of magic squares of line sum R. Uh, n by n uh, magic square of line sum r. So the coefficients of the numerator uh, are also dimensions of vector spaces. Uh, so in order to get this vector space, uh, this ring has certain dimension d, let us say, it's, uh, and it, it turns out to be what is called a Gorenstein ring. So Gorenstein rings, they exhibit certain symmetry always. And that symmetry of h d h n minus i equal to h i is actually a reflection of the fact that this ring is a Gorenstein ring. So to get these HI as dimensions of vector spaces, one goes mod a regular, maximal regular sequence, one gets an Artin local ring. That Artin local ring is a sum of many uh, vector spaces which form a graded Artinian ring. So that's that's how one can identify those vector spaces whose dimensions are HIs, the coefficients of the uh, numerator. So, so this description that you just gave it explains the, the coefficients in the polynomials that appear in the numerator and denominator. Yeah. Uh, right, in the numerator. Yeah, denominator mm -hmm. is very simple. It is 1 minus lambda to the power sum number. Yeah, 1 minus t. That, that was already known to Hilbert. That is Hilbert's third theorem. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, okay, so what I'm still missing is there's no analog of Frobenius, there's no analog of no. Uh, fixed uh, fixed uh, cohomology space on which an operator is operating. Yeah, that's what I understand. And the way what I understand, yeah, what occurs here is a Artin Gorenstein Artin ring, and uh, that is enough to predict the symmetry. But but the the log concavity requires completely different tools from convex geometry, which that's which right. we, the, so log concavity uh, was proved, you know, uh, just a few years ago. That's right, uh, and that paper has not appeared yet, if I'm not mistaken. No, no, paper has appeared, yeah. Oh, the paper has appeared, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Has, okay, okay, I, I think you sent me a link to uh, a paper on the archive then. Right, it, it has appeared. Oh, it has appeared, okay, that's good. okay. Yeah, so uh, the way I understand some, really some wonderful things are happening here. The, the way the Hilbert series having a functional equation is equivalent to being the ring being born state. You know, so there has to be some way of understanding the ring theoretic thing from the uh, properties of the Hilbert series itself. You know, and, and then that's what's going that's what's going on. And of course, the Riemann hypothesis that you is is a, is only for a certain family of these things that are coming from geometry. And so, yes, the question is: To what extent are you going to have Riemann? You know hypothesis or whatever, and maybe you have to look at these higher Jensen polynomials associated to that 
particular polynomial and to see if there are all these, um, to what extent are they positive definite or all the roots real hyperbolic. You know? So this is what I'm saying. I'm, I think, and, and as Jugo mentioned uh, correctly, uh, the all of these uh, quotients of the uh, Hilbert series have inter have interpretation and the ring, uh, you have to understand the uh, combinatorial aspects of these polytopes that are that emerge and the geometry. So it is very much the combinatorial geometry that is encoded in the ring theory. And that's uh, what seems to be extremely yeah. important. Yeah. I mean, magic squares uh, together, they form a convex cone. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think so, so it's a very interesting. I, I think um, the the Anand uh, Dumir and the paper uh, is a product out of Punjab University, if I'm not mistaken. And I think all these three people were at the same place. Uh, yeah, Harsh Anand was a PhD student. Pardon me? Harsh Anand, whose picture you had question mark. I did, yeah. I'll send you, I'll send you her picture. Uh, she was a PhD student of uh, Vishwasan Dumir. Oh, okay, okay, I didn't know that again. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. We, we celebrated uh, BC Dumir's 60th birthday in HRI many, many years ago. Okay. Yeah, yeah where uh, Professor Bruns uh, gave an exposition on uh, these conjectures. So I wanted to just point out uh, you know, one more interesting place where log concave sequences occur. And that is uh, when we analyze uh, what are called Milner number of a isolated hypersurface singularity. So Bernard Tessy uh, constructed a sequence of numbers which are called sectional Milner numbers of a isolated hypersurface singularity in complex analytic geometry. And these numbers, he proved that they also, <laughs> they said is, they are log concave. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, in convex geometry, mixed volumes of polytopes they right. form a log concave sequence. Right, and those are those are used in the final con, con, uh, work in the uh, whose work I believe. Right, 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 right. So it's really mysterious how this notion, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in uh, occurring in so many different contexts. But uh, but I'm intrigued by the connection to the Riemann hypothesis as well, and uh, hopefully uh, it would open up a new chapter and try and understand where, what are these polynomials that are coming up. Uh, we, I don't think people have really studied significance. I think people are just bulldozing away and proving theorems, but uh, I think one has to stand back and see what is the significance of some of this stuff. I don't think we can dismiss it off completely, um, as uh, David Farmer suggests, but on the other hand, I don't think we can embrace it as much as uh, Mary seems to suggest. I think there has to be some, what is the meaning of all this? Samia, you're muted. So, uh, thank you. So, if there's any more questions, please please ask Professor Ramuthi. Uh, I I would like to ask a question. Chan, please. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the way uh, you explained it, uh, you first mentioned the Anand Gupta conjecture. Then you went to a sta went to Stanley's conjecture, which was uh, sort of a more generalized version of the Anand Gupta conjecture. Then you mentioned Rock's conjecture, which is an even more generalization. And then you said Junha and others uh, proved the final generalized step of all these conjectures. So my question is whether uh, and Junha, I suppose, uh, have used the most recent and most advanced techniques in mathematics. So. My question is, are there uh, more elementary or uh, easier proofs uh, to the Anand Gupta conjecture or the conjectures that are not as difficult or as abstract as Roth's conjecture? So Anand Gupta conjecture is much less abstract than Roth's conjecture. It doesn't use metroids and other advancements. So are there more, are there easier ways to understand these uh, uh, conjectures that are less abstract or is Junha's work the only thing that we have in our hands? Okay, well, that's a good question. Um, firstly, it's Rota, Rota, not Roth. Uh, Rota's okay. Roth is also a number theorist. Uh, no, Roth has nothing to do with it. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, John Carlo Rota, yeah. So, Rota's conductor. 
And uh, yes, I believe the work of um, uh, work on the Anand Dumir uh, Gupta conjecture has been extensively simplified. And there, as Professor Varma was pointing out, there's a beautiful paper by him, actually, in the math student, which I referred to, and also a paper, a follow up paper by Brooms, um, which discusses um, essentially how one could get all this from elementary commutative algebra at the level of um, T. M. McDonald, you know, some books like that. Uh, it doesn't really use, I mean, you have to use something. But you don't need to use uh, so much artillery that uh, Jung Hua's work is using. Um, so there's an exposition, there's expository stuff there. So that's answer to your first part of the question. You don't need to use Jung Hua's work in trying to solve the Anand Dumir Gupta conjecture. You don't need that. What I was trying to say is that there's a structural similarity in the conjectures and that it needed more elaborate methods, the earlier methods of commutative algebra were not sufficient. You needed a little bit more um, formalism. Formalism, very much uh, what is called the standard conjectures in algebraic geometry that Rosendieck had formulated the Poincare duality, the Hard Love Shift theorem, the Hodge Riemann relations, so called Hodge theory, somehow entering into this picture, uh, some sort of abstract Hodge theory that was in incorporated and initiated by John Bus work. Uh, that is basically what these more complicated um, conjectures regarding the Whitney numbers of the first and second kind in the Metroid theory. I hope that uh, answers your question. I think in the future we can um, perhaps look forward to perhaps simplifications of some of this work. Okay, so thank you. Any more questions? If not, then let's thank the speaker. Uh, thank you for being a part of identity. Thanks again, Professor Ramut. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's good to see everybody. Uh, have a good day, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you.